The Mystery of Stars and Numbers In the search for a supreme standard, a prototype of order and harmony, the priests look to the heavens where, inaccessible, the stars move along. A minute and continuous observation of the heavenly bodies led them to that wisdom which we call astrology. In their everlasting round, the planet gods were performing a pantomime, expressive of the law which ruled the universe. The stargazers understood the meaning of this harmonious play. They could foretell the configurations of the grandiose rondo, and they knew also in what way the heavenly movement would affect happenings on earth. In the world hierarchy, the superior rules over the inferior, and the star gods were the heavenly rulers of all that lay below. Among them, the seven planets were the most powerful, the interpreter gods. Jupiter Marduk was the creator, the awakener of the dead, the victor over chaos. His bright star was a torch, a ruler of the sky. When appearing in the moon aura, he bestowed male offspring. His influence was always favorable. The forebodings of the moon, sin, were ambiguous because of, of its irregular phases. Growth was hindered by its contraction, stimulated by its expansion. The sun, Samas, carrier of life and light, was likewise ambiguous, bringing sometimes scorching and drought. Uncertain was Mercury, Nebo, the scribe and god of wisdom, who wrote down the deeds of men. Knowledge can bring forth good and evil. Saturn, Adar, the god of hunting, was propitious to public affairs as well as to family life. But he, too, seems generally to exert evil influence. They called him the Great Misfortune. Evil was Mars, Nergal, the god of the dead and of pestilence, causing war and foretelling death to the king. He destroyed the wheat and the date harvest. He stunted the growth of cattle and fish row. He was called the fiend, the Persian, the fox, etc. Venus, Ishtar, the goddess of motherhood and love, was beneficent. From her eminent great healing power, by her vegetation is brought forth. However, she was dangerous to widows and to sucklings. Besides the planets, the signs of the zodiac also are offsprings of Chaldean astrology, and six of its original figures still exist to this day. They are the bull, the twins, the lion, the balance, the scorpion, and the fishes. Although little is known of their symbolism, it may be surmised that these figures originally were closely connected with earthly affairs. Thus, the price of wheat was fixed according to the position of the heavenly balance, rather than according to the quantity produced by the harvest. When the sign of the fishes shone weakly, it meant that fish row was affected adversely. When Nergal, the evil planet, approached the sign of the scorpion, it meant that the king was about to die from a scorpion's sting. In the astrologer's language, symbols and allegories were adopted which were enigmas to the profane. The sun sheds tears. Jupiter is surrounded by courtiers. The moon travels in a carriage and accepts various crowns from the stars she approaches. Crowns of the evil wind, of anger, of happiness, of iron, of bronze, of copper, and of gold. Venus seizes foreign goods and wears crowns of different colors according to her conjunction with Mars, Saturn, Mercury, or Jupiter. These enigmatic images were expressed in the old tongue of Akkad or Sumer, the language of the gods, in which only the initiate conversed. The cosmic secrets were hidden from the people because of the fear that knowledge of the future might either discourage them or cause them to abandon their daily work from joy. Those who had knowledge of the stars were more influential than king's ministers, and foreign rulers consulted them frequently. Diodorus of Sicily gives witness of their prestige. Having observed the stars during an enormous number of years, he says, they know more precisely than anyone else the movements and the influence of the stars, and they predict with accuracy many things to come. From ancient times, the known world had been divided according to the four quarters of the sky, the south was Akkad, Babylonia, the north, Saburtu, Assyria, the east, Elam, Persia, the west, Syria and Palestine. The movements of the stars and other events in the sky were interpreted according to this astrological geography. 
Thus it was considered a natural thing when thunder resounded in the south, Akkad, whereas thunder from other directions was considered as an omen. On the twenty-ninth of the month, the moon was favorable to Akkad, but unfavorable to Amuru, etc. Of still greater intricacy was the Chaldean concept of star substitution. Its meaning has been a mystery until a recent discovery cast light upon it. In certain cases of star interpretation, a planet or a fixed star might be replaced by a constellation or zodiacal figure. Thus Saturn might be replaced by the balance, by Cassiopeia, by Orion, or by the Raven. This enigmatic relationship was based upon similarities of color and strength of light among the stars. Heavenly bodies of the same luminosity and color were believed to be related to one another, a theory which permitted many variations and subtleties in star interpretation. As far back as memory reached, metals were related to the underworld. They lay hidden in the hollow of the earth, and no heavenly stars shone upon them. Yet, in the wish to relate all earthly things to heaven, the astrologer saw an affinity between metals and planets, an idea which still haunted the medieval alchemists. To the Chaldeans, gold was the metal of the sun, silver that of the moon, lead that of Saturn. Tin had its correspondence in Jupiter, iron in Mars, and copper in Venus. Like a mysterious incised seal representing the pre-established mathematical harmony of the universe, certain sacred numbers are to be found in the skies, numbers which seem to confirm the basic idea of astrology. They appear to assist each other and lend themselves to many speculations. Thus the number seven occurs in the main stars of the Great Bear and in the Lesser Bear, in the Pleiades and in Orion. Seven are the days of the moon quarters, seven are the planets of antiquity. Twelve and thirty seem to be mystically connected. Twelve are the zodiacal signs, thirty is the number of a moon period, and thirty are the years of Saturn's circuit. The product of twelve and thirty is the approximate number of the days of the year. Many such relations can be found. They offer to the indefatigable astrologer a wide field for his inquiries and quests. Together with astrology, the concept of mystic numbers came into being and, like astrology, numerology has survived through the ages with astounding vitality. Since the Chaldeans were such keen observers, it is difficult to believe that all their wisdom was of an arbitrary nature. No doubt many features of their knowledge were based on a true notion of meteorology, physics, chemistry, and medicine. Let us not forget, however, that astrology, which has been the stimulus to many scientific discoveries, was also theology. In its vast domain there is nourishment for both spirit and soul, and there can be no doubt that astrology owes its longevity to its psychic rather than to its intellectual value. Yet it is good to remember also that the great astronomer Kepler made his discovery at the end of his vain search for that law which unifies the universe. His desire for unification was similar to that which had animated the Chaldean astrologers, whose early wisdom still exerted a powerful influence at the dawn of modern science. Astrology and numerology are such great discoveries that no epoch has escaped their influence. At the end of the 18th century, the Romanticist Novalis still believed in the mystical essence of numbers. It is very likely, he says, that in nature a marvelous mysticity of numbers is at work, and, also, and in history also. Is not everything of significance, symmetry, and strange connection? Can God not reveal himself as well in mathematics as in other sciences?